and uh, talk about some of the things that we can uh, do with them. Um, this is a good book right in here to point you. There we go. Uh, another picture or two of some donkeys. This one is at uh, Samaria. And those are the hills of Samaria. I like to sometimes show you things more than what we're showing you, you know, because you're seeing terrain also. And I think I had shown you a picture that had to do with the hill of Samaria, the one hill of Samaria, but it's hilly all the way around it. And uh, <clears throat> I don't recall the reference, but you would be able to locate it, in, especially if you use the computer. Uh, it, God is talking to the city of Samaria. He's telling them about the captivity. And he says to them <clears throat> that I'm going to bring the nations and they're going to surround you on the mountains around you. And th then they're going to watch while I destroy you. So, of course, you know that God's use of nations, like the use of Assyria and uh, Babylon and uh, the uh, Persians and so on and Alexander the Great and the Romans, that's all God's plan to use nations that way. And so that's what he said. And, and when you stand on Samaria... I have actually made pictures, so I'm looking in all directions around. And there are, it's like there's, it's a, like here with valley, and then there are mountains on every side of it. And so this is the, uh, something very interesting. And you see some of those mountains on one side there. And uh, that uh, fella, the, this was, uh, I could tell this was a guy who was selling antiquities that he had dug out. I mean, people do that. They dig out coins, and they find jewelry, and they find other things, and then they sell it to the tourists that come along the way. And uh, there is something I learned. This is Leon, the back of Leon, on the donkey. <laughs> now, if some of you ever meet Leon, and you tell him all these things I've said about him, it's going to really be bad. But he has a really good one that he, he likes to tell. He tells people that I tell people when we meet them, I'm Peril Jenkins, this is my father. <laughs> and he said, and the problem is, they believe it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of fun together, and we learned something on this trip in 2018, I think it was, in Jordan we learned that there was another exit from Petra. You don't have to go back through the Seek in the same way you came in. And there are about, you know, 20 or 30 guys trying to get you to ride their donkey or their horse or their camel uh, outside the city. But there was a guy at the kind of the end of the trail in the, in the antiquities area. And he said, come, go with me. And we were tired, and we said, okay, we'll go with you. And so I'm on a donkey behind Leon. And this one reminded me of something. Do you see what's happening there? This road is the road that is used. I didn't know it till that day. It is the road that is used by the dignitaries and others who might come to visit. So they don't have to come through where, like all the tourists do, because it would be a crowd of them, and so they'll come in in their cars on a nice road here, and you see there's a concrete barrier there, and what's happening is that his donkey keeps rubbing up against that little fence. You see it? And the man who owns the donkey, or who is in the manager, I guess, he may not own it, probably does, and he's, he's saying, Get away, get away from the wall. It's rubbing Leon's leg into the wall. Reminds you of any biblical story? <laughs> yeah, look at that. This is about Balaam. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. <laughs> At any rate, the guy got us up to the end, well, the first street that's up on a 
good level, you know, with the town. And when we got there, uh, he said, this is it. This is the end of the ride and let us off. And he went back to pick up his next group, two people. And uh, we had to walk to our hotel, which was not too difficult to do at any rate. This is one I've shown you before, but I wanted to talk about the yoke a little bit more. Uh, you see the yoke there with the animals. We talked about being unequally yoked. Paul used the illustration in 1 Corinthians about being unequally yoked with unbelievers and not to let that happen. And so here in uh, the book of Matthew, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So it won't be a burden, you see. You will find rest for your souls. He said, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And there are those who say that this word, the idea that the yoke is easy, is kind of the idea of its easy fitting. In other words, the yoke has been cut in such a way, so carefully for each of the animals, that when it is put on their neck, it is not a great burden to them. They're able to pull the burden, the wagon, whatever it is that is there. Then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul writes to somebody he calls a true comrade in some versions. Or a genuine yoke fella is the real meaning of the word. And it could apply to any faithful worker. We don't know if it's you know, some particular person he has in mind. It means a person who pulls well in a harness for two. Not everybody works well with others. There are people who do good work individually, but not so well when they work with somebody else. You've seen it in the workplace, wherever you are, and maybe we've seen it at church sometimes too. And there are others who think this is a personal name, that that word that means yoke fella could have been given as a name because people choose rather unusual names. And this is a yoke that is an illustration of one. This is from Katsreen in northern... Uh, Israel, north of Galilee, northern and upper Galilee. And uh, you can see that it's nothing more than just a piece of wood, a piece of log, and then it has been fitted with these smaller pieces to go on the neck of the animals. And uh, that one does not look to me like it could be all that well fitting, but it might be. In the uh, Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv at the university, they show a plow and a yoke, and a, the yoke is for two ox. Do you see it here in the distance, right here? See one here and one here. And so that one's a little bit different in that there's a upper piece that fits on the animals and then also the lower piece connecting it together. There's a typical plow that would have been used in biblical times, and then also some other things that are used, perhaps. And I've wondered if maybe one of these down here would be the sort of thing that Paul was talking about. Remember when he said that the Lord said, it's hard for you to kick against the prick? And so you have a way to get the animal to move on forward. You, you know, you prod them. And so that perhaps is what is involved in that one. So let's go to the camels now. We've talked a lot about the donkeys. And uh, did I mention the New York Times? No, uh, I didn't think I did. I just, if I had learned this earlier today, it would have been in the lesson. But I learned it through a list I get. It's called AGAD. And it's a list of articles and books and materials that have been published in, on the field of biblical studies and religious studies and archaeology and so on. And uh, I looked at it just a short time before I left the house. And here was the best 8 by 10 
of a donkey's face that I have ever seen. And there has been a vast study about the donkeys and their ancestry and going back, finding, you know, where they originated and use among men and that sort of thing. So I wish I had been able to see that sooner because I, would, I think it's really great. And if you have access to the New York Times, you might look it up. You can look it up online and write, just put in Ancestry of Donkeys, and I think it will come up. But it's really fabulous. Now, the camels we're going to talk about. Abraham sent camels when he was trying to get a wife for Isaac. That means, go back to our early lessons, that means that we're from, we're in Beersheba, that region, and we're going now, we're going to the north, we're going to past the Sea of Galilee, we're going past Damascus, we're going up all the way to the Euphrates River and to the area of Haran. I mean, that is a long trip. That's a long trip in a car. And it, is, it would be a tiring one if you drove that route that way. And so Abraham is getting the wife for Isaac. This is the only time there was a trip like this. Because Abraham had come down from there. I called South Down. So he had come from there. And now he's trying to get a wife for Isaac. And so it says that the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master, from Abraham. Abraham was a wealthy man in his cattle. And so he gets ten of them. He set out without a, with a variety of good things of his masters in his hand, meaning under his control, I would take it. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. So that's the northern part. That's the peak of the, what did we call it? The Fertile Crescent. So right up at the top of the Fertile Crescent. And there are many who believe that uh, that's really where Ur was located in that region, not uh, continuing on down to the south. And I'm inclined to think that's correct, but no way to know for sure at this point. So a few pictures of camels. You find sometimes a caravan like this. There are more than just these three in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, they travel across there. And then also here's one in the area that shows the baby and the mom. And the baby is a little bit you know, frightened and kind of stays under the mom and looks around to see the cars that are stopping to make pictures and so on. Not that many. I didn't think anybody else stopped while I was there, but uh, it, it's just something that attracts their attention. And uh, so there they are. And then here are some that are in the Transjordan Desert. So this is the desert along the area going to Petra from Amman, Jordan, but further south, closer to Petra. And uh, this is the, these are camels that would be there. There are some baby ones, uh, just kind of a whole family and probably more that are not in that picture. Here again, this is near the Dead Sea. I mean, you'll see them all over the area, all over the area. You see good signs like that. Be very careful because you have uh, camels and uh, the speed limit is 90. How fast is that to us? Yeah, about 52, 4 degrees, 50, who said 6, 56? It's close to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, 6 point something, 6.2 times, and then you come up with the, with the answer to that. So you see these signs, and there are, in that region right there, there are some camel farms. So you do have to be careful of the camels that are there and drive safely. Now we saw also the people who were going away into Assyrian captivity. And they were riding on the uh, uh, wagon 
They had uh, a horse, maybe more, maybe two. Uh, it looked more like a was it an oxen that was pulling them, and they were carrying bags of grain. They'd have to stop along the way and eat, prepare food. Just think about that: four months' trip at least. And we have this example that is on the relief of Sennacherib, and it shows the people who are being uh, the booty that is being transported from Lachish, which is in southern, almost down 10 miles from the coast, pardon me, 10 miles from the coast, and this has to go all the way to Assyria. And so they had to transport these goods from Lachish all the way back. And we mentioned the fact that they stayed in the country from 635, no, yeah, is that right? 635 to, 7, to 610. So they were there for 25 years in the country from north to south. Imagine how many animals they killed. Imagine how many chickens they killed. Imagine how many fruit trees they took all the fruit from the people and ate them as they went along the way. And what do people do when an army comes through like that? They stay away. You, you know that's what would happen. And so you, that's a really a terrible thing. There's a statement that is made in the New Testament with regard to the eye of a needle. And so I wanted to show you some needles. These are needles that are made of bronze and bone and glass. And there are some that are made of bronze, some smaller ones on the bottom. These are from the Roman period. And they're in the British Museum, as you see the notation there. And in Luke chapter 18, verse 25, Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I'm confident I have pictures of one of those gates in Jerusalem where people say there is the eye of the needle. There is an argument that is made like that, and it is that here's this door over here, and it's larger than this. It's going to be double the size of this, perhaps, and even taller. And then down low, like this, there is a small door that will open. And people can go in through that door. And, uh, you know, by stooping down, something like that. And a lot of people say that's what he was saying. In other words, you have to get down low, take your backpack off, and go through no, I don't think so. I see no reason why Jesus wasn't talking about a camel and a, knight and a needle. They had both. And so he's talking about the real thing that it is more difficult for a, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And uh, so that's my understanding of it. So what I have done here is reduce the camel and enlarge the needle, and it still won't work for us, will it? There's just no way that you can do it. And that camel is in the Jordan Valley. They're, they're all over that part of the world. You see them everywhere. And it goes way back. There have been those who have said that there were not camels in the days of Abraham, and uh, yet we have studies that show uh, one was done by Joseph Free back in the, uh, one of the journals of the ancient Near East, and he points out that this was something that was known in that time, and that there's lots of evidence of it. There are little figurines, there are all sorts of things that show that the people had these uh, camels. Uh, some other animals, goats, how about goats? You love goats? Well, the goats are interesting. And in 2 Samuel 25 and verse 2, we talked about Nabal and how that when uh, uh, David and his men were coming toward Carmel, 
in the edge of the wilderness, south of Bethlehem, south of Jerusalem, that uh, there was the thought that, uh, you know, this, this would be a real problem. And Nabal was a guy who was easily roused, and so he might create a problem. And his wife, Abigail, fixed a lot of food. She says, or it says, that the man whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it came about while he was sharing his sheep in Carmel that that's what happened. So imagine a guy having a thousand goats and he has uh, then uh, how many sheep? Three thousand sheep. Three times as many sheep as he does goats. You don't see as many goats. I've not seen as many goats today as there are sheep. So perhaps that's pretty well standard that there will be fewer number. And uh, lots of pictures of the goats with the sheep. And you'll find sometimes a guy will have a, a sheep, uh, he'll have his sheep and he'll have goats. And uh, the goat will often wear a bell. And they go with the sheep. And they somehow lead the way. Now, the shepherd gives calls to the, to the sheep so that they'll come along and go with him but he will have this animal that will help and the animal will go ahead. And uh, here's what I've read about this in a book by John Beck. And he seems to be very knowledgeable in lots of fields, teaches some at the uh, uh, university community, co not community, uh, the Jerusalem University College in the old city, just outside the old city of Jerusalem. And he says that the reason for this is that the sheep will stay in the same place and they will eat the grass even down to the roots. And I've seen them eating in the wilderness of Judea when I didn't think there was a bite to be had anywhere. And they just keep on eating. They keep eating. They keep eating. Right there in that same spot. And Beck says that in the uh, situation with the goats, the goats eat and move on. So by putting the goats with the sheep, then that allows them, they will follow the goat. So there's a situation where they are providing some good service. I don't know that for sure, but that's, I told you the source where that comes from. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 7, it says, Then you shall take, make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. And you shall make 11 curtains in all. So they were made from the goat's hair. It's used for various purposes. Remember also the scapegoat. On one day out of the year, they would take the goat, place the sins of the people upon it, of course, that's wishful thinking, we understand. But then the goat would take, go away into the wilderness, leading away these sins. And uh, I saw this scene and photographed it one day. There were two little boys standing around watching. We'd stopped at an oasis. They're mostly desert, mostly nothing. And every now and then you'll find uh, some palm trees or something of that sort. And uh, you know in the Old Testament, when the Israel came to a place, they counted the palm trees. Said there were 70 there in that oasis. Think about it. If you hadn't, se <laughs> if you hadn't seen any trees for days and days, and you came to an oasis, I think especially the kids would be, you know, challenged to count and see how many trees there are. And so they go around and count, and they counted 70. So this place didn't have 70, but it had a good number of the trees. And uh, the goat had just been born. And I cropped the picture. But the afterbirth was still hanging from her. 
So the goat is right there. She's nuzzling it, trying. It hasn't even been on its feet yet, and she's trying to get it up. Some of my photos are actually used in other things besides religious publications, occasionally, and uh, I have seen it recently uh, being used in some uh, uh, farm and agriculture sort of publications as well. So find, people find these things of interest in the work that they do. Uh, the animal skins of the goat, particularly, are used to be wine or water containers. In Luke 5.37, it says that no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out. And the skins will be ruined. So the idea is that they have to be flexible and if they get tight and hard, then as the wine ferments, that shows that's what happened, the wine ferments, and then that would burst these. So, believe it or not, this was on my first trip to Jordan. And I saw a boy getting water in a wine skin. There's a little spring there today. It, it was out in the open then, more or less. And at that at, uh, presently, it is, has a you know, well house built around it. And people go there with their pottery containers and get water. But uh, there are, looks like two of them, and they've simply closed off all of the openings, and then they fill it with water, and then they open it up at home, and that's their water for the day for their cooking and their drinking and so on. And of course, some people, mostly today, you would find people getting it in pottery that they have brought with them. Uh, sheep. I love these sheep pictures. They are so nice. This is at uh, uh, just on the edge of the Valley of Elah. And there's a village called Sako, a biblical place called Sako, S-O-C-O-H. And the people that live near there uh, bring their sheep out, not all early in the morning, because this is perhaps closer to mid midday. And they're going to bring them out and let them graze at certain places wherever they can. And uh, here they come, just a lot of them. And you will sometimes see the goats in with these. In northern Syria, almost to the border with Turkey, uh, I saw this scene. It was the whole scene was just was just fabulous. Uh, there are tents. There's a tent over there, a tent over here, a tent closer to the road, and these people are really right beside the road. Uh, I almost never have any problem making photographs. People are glad to cooperate. Uh, I had one guy in Jordan when I tried to make pictures and was making pictures. He was talking to someone else, to another shepherd perhaps, and uh, he turned and waved me off. So I left. I didn't want to create a problem you know, there in a foreign country because I don't know how good the embassy is. <laughs> over there. So at any rate, I left that. But uh, this, this scene was, and I, don't, I could, have, could have put in all, pictures of all of them, but I'll describe it. Here's an old man, looked as old as my grandfather when I was a baby. You know, that's really old. And so here, here he is, and he's, uh, he, he's got the sheep, and I made a picture of him. He has his prize sheep ram. And so here's this ram and this the ram and he makes his picture and he's got his staff, you know, like a shepherd would use. And he's holding that. And so here is the sheep. And they're just all around here. A tent over there, remember, tent over there, tent closer to here. And then there's a pen, just using wire. They, they use everything.
to make sheep folds. And so he's got the sheep here. They all here together. So they, they could go out. This is kind of somewhat mountainous, low mountains in the area. And he's waiting there. And what's she doing? She's milking the sheep. So they line them up. She's ready to move from one to the other. And she's milking the sheep. Uh, and that's going to be a good long job for just one person. Uh, maybe I can, Paul, use this illustration. Remember how he said, uh, talking about the right to pay those who work for the Lord, preachers, or particular he's dealing with there himself. And he said, who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? It's proper, it's right to do that if a person devotes them t their time to that. And then look, you can see the milk. Two, 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 she's doing two at once. I never learned to do that. I, I lived on the farm, but I didn't have to milk cows, so I never learned how to, how to do that. But I'm sure it could be done pretty easily. And so uh, when you read the story back in Judges 5 about uh, uh, Sierra, uh, he asked for water. And you remember what Jael gave him? She said, what you need is a good warm glass of milk. And what does that make babies do? Go to sleep. So she puts him to sleep right there. And then she takes a... I don't have a picture of one of those. <laughs> and she runs it through his head. How do they what? Oh, yes. No, they're not tied up. It is interesting. And they're, they're at least too deep. In other words, on the other side of these, you've got another one. And they just are lined up maybe some places three. And they're all there waiting until the shepherd tells them to go. They do not move until they're given instructions to go. So it's really neat to watch that, see that. I've seen that scene uh, also in Turkey in another place where the woman is uh, seated like that and and watering. Now, I showed you this picture once before in connection with the cistern or well. It's probably a cistern and it has collected the water. He knows where it is and he's got sheep and goats together. Uh, the sheepfold is interesting. Reuben and Gad were living in Gilead, the territory of Jordan that is north in the northern portion. And they said, we will build here sheepfolds for our livestock. And so they were given that territory. And King Hezekiah, the Bible says, made for himself sheepfolds for the flocks. We learned recently that he had the seals that went onto the jar handles. Lamelech to the king, to the king at Hebron, this is where these go. Or the king at Lachish, that's where these go. They're for the king. And so that's where the government had its warehouses. And he also had a situation where he had sheep folds for the flocks, you see. And that's his flock. So they had lots of, uh, kind of kind of reminds me a bit more of the uh, king or queen of England. You know, they have their own land, they have their own supplies and, and things of that sort. So we have that. And here in the case of David, there's a reference in Psalm 78. It says, he also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. This work was very important work that David was doing because he learned how to be a king. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. That's Israel, of course. Jacob is. And Israel, his inheritance. That's using the parallelism that we find in poetic literature of the Old Testament. 
So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with skillful hands. So David is given that responsibility. In the, uh, uh, if you go to Egypt sometime and you go to uh, Luxor and they have a light show, sound and light, and it's very nice. And at the sound and light show, uh, the king talks, the pharaoh talks. And one of the things that he says right off, that I am the shepherd of my people. In other words, he lets it be known immediately that this is his responsibility to shepherd the people, take care of the people. It, being a shepherd in the Bible world is really an honorable thing. It's really a great thing. Uh, there was a book written, uh, oh, I don't know how many years ago, 30 years ago maybe, about the, the, uh, a shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm, I think was the title of it. And it was a nice book, a good book. I enjoyed it. But it was written by a man who knew only Australian and New Zealand sheep practices. And in reading it, I, I understood or I recognized that he didn't know about the Middle East as it is revealed in the Bible and in these Egyptian records and others. So he told about this in, from the standpoint of the people there. That in, in New Zealand, they have 73,000 sheep. 73,000 sheep. And uh, we stayed, I stayed on a farm with a group. We had to called a homestay. And so we stayed there, and they showed us what they did. They have paddocks, and that means that there is a fence around, maybe four of these, and it's across the, the valley, over on the hill from their house. And these people uh, have a dog, and they can go open the gate, put the dog in there, and they open the gates and they can send the dog to the furthest one and the dog can bring back the animals to where they want them. In other words, they have to change because they, they would eat up all the grass in one, if they stayed in one place. You see the same kind of practices in Ireland. They'll, they have shows like that where they do the same thing and they use the dogs that way. But uh, this is something where you really learn how to do this on your own. And Jesus talked about the sheepfold in John chapter 10 and spent a good bit of time talking about it. I've seen these sheepfolds made out of wire. I've seen them made out of bushes. I mean, they're ones that have been cut. And that's what you have here. Uh, I've seen them made out of, uh, well, I haven't told you this, and it's been in a picture or two, but I didn't call attention to it at the time. And I <clears throat> don't think I've got a photo in the, there for this, but people save the cow droppings, and they pile them up. And they put them on their roof. And you can see roofs that are just filled. They're laying out. What are they doing? They're drying them for what purpose? What? Fuel. Yeah, it's going to be the one, it's how they keep the house warm. It's how they cook their meals. And they mix lime with it, and maybe something else, but lime I believe is what's mixed with it, and there's not a great smell. So sometimes the kitchen, the, the cooking portion, sits outside the house, you see, and then they cook from inside. So the smoke is going out, not into the house. And uh, so I've actually seen these and have some pictures of them where you have, this is made just of these cow piles. And that can make a, you can make one out of that as well, a sheep fold. Uh, this one's in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, between the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon uh, fields and they've used rocks. They've picked up rocks. They've got a little path they can drive around and then if the 
other end, I believe it is, we'll see in just a moment, maybe not this one, but the next picture, you'll see that there's the opening. And so when Jesus used the illustration, I am the door of the sheep, it means that I sit right here and I protect the sheep. So this is high enough, basically, that you don't have uh, wolves that are going to come over and get into the sheep. He's there in case something should happen, and he will be ready to provide care for the sheep. Very beautiful illustrations that are used. And uh, these are the sheep and the goats. It says, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25 and verse 32. I think the meaning of that, of course, is that the goat is uh, less valuable than the sheep. Uh, and so there would be a different sale price when the sale day came. So there's a certain time. Uh, it's usually on Fridays in the old city of Jerusalem. Used to, you would see on the on the uh, northwest corner of the old city, you would see the sheep beginning and goats beginning to be gathered there for sale, kind of like an auction they would have a cattle sale. So there's the separation of the one from the other. This is interesting. This was like something you read in the Bible too. There's Leon on the left. He really liked that picture. And before I knew it, he already was getting him a photograph of that. And there are two guys coming along talking. And there's uh, one of them carrying the sheep, a lamb, more or less. And that's at San Shanli Urfa. Shanli Urfa in Turkey is, according to the Muslim tradition, is the home of Abraham. They have his birthplace there, and uh, they have a place where he performed miracles and so on and so on. So this gentleman, for whatever reason, maybe he's taking the sheep to the vet. I don't know what he's doing. But he was walking with the sheep a little bit earlier with the like you'd walk a dog. Unusual to see that, but he's in town. And so then he has this 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 scene. So it's rather interesting. Anybody have any further question about that or any comments about it? We've got about yeah. Do they do what? Uh, with in the ear, you'll see usually some kind of tag in the ear will be used, and then also uh, there's an thing that they do and it might show up in some of the pictures and I'll show uh, they will put uh, on the ewes that need to be bred they will put uh, something a red color on the back you know and then they know well they don't put it on her they put it on the belly of the male the ram and so they know then the ones that have been bred so they can separate those in and then concentrate on the others. So they have yeah, they have plans for all these things. I really don't know the answer to that. I I'd have to look it up in the, the butcher shop. <laughs> but I have no idea, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, cows are like that. It has to be a certain time. So the dairymen tell me that it has to be that time every day, or otherwise it gets uh, gets bad. Well, that's interesting. Uh, okay, any? Huh? It's no, it's no, it's it's twelve till. Huh? Well, I, I just assume it wouldn't. <laughs>
I've only shown you about 30 pictures, and I have a hundred and something here tonight. <laughs> so you know what that means, of course. Well, it's a good place in a minute for us to stop when we end to get the indication there. Any, is there another question anybody has about something we've talked about tonight? I, I just know what I see, and I don't know a lot of these things, you know, but uh, yeah, on, except having seen them for a long period of time throughout this part of the world. And then as I read the Bible, that's the amazing thing, how it just fits exactly the way it was then. It's just exactly that. Well, they're the children. They, make, they, they get the alarm going again. That'd get us out of here. Okay. Good to see each of you. See you.